Hey everyone, this lesson is on Gilbert syndrome. So we're gonna talk about what this condition is. We're also gonna talk about some of the causes, signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed and how it's treated. So Gilbert syndrome is a benign genetic condition involving recurrent episodes of jaundice. So jaundice is yellowing of the skin and the whites of the eyes. And it's caused by high levels of a pigmented compound known as bilirubin. So we can see the skin is yellow in appearance. And the key with regards to Gilbert syndrome is that it is an unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. We're going to talk about what I mean when I say this in the next slide. So unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, hyper being high, bilirubin is that bilirubin we talked about before, and emia is with regards to the blood. So high levels of bilirubin in the blood, and it's unconjugated. It is either a onosomal dominant or autosomal recessive condition, depending on the mutation. 70% of cases are caused by mutation in the UGT gene, and a mutation in UGT1A1 is autosomal dominant. And why this happens, why there is recurrent episodes of jaundice, is due to the fact that there's a decreased, oftentimes mild decrease in the activity of UDP glucuronyl transferase. We'll talk about this enzyme in the next slide as well. So that's where we see this UGT, UDP glucuronyl transferase. So this is the enzyme that is affected. I'll actually talk about this pathogenic mechanism in more detail in the next slide, but briefly, unconjugated bilirubin, which is a breakdown product of hemoglobin. So hemoglobin breakdown will lead to unconjugated bilirubin. This unconjugated bilirubin goes to the liver and becomes conjugated to conjugated bilirubin. So it can be excreted from the body. We'll talk about this again in the next slide. What is the epidemiology of Gilbert syndrome? It is estimated to affect three to 7% of the general population. It depends on what country we look at, but generally speaking, usually around three to seven percent of the population may be affected by this condition. And males outnumber females with regards to Gilbert syndrome. Now we talked about the mechanism briefly in the last slide, but I'll talk about it more here. So unconjugated bilirubin, again from breakdown of hemoglobin, goes to the liver. And the reason it does this is because unconjugated bilirubin is not water soluble. And we need it to be water soluble. So it enters into the liver and UGT1A1, we talked about this enzyme before, it actually takes glucuronic acid and adds it to the unconjugated bilirubin. So glucuronic acid becomes added to unconjugated bilirubin to produce conjugated bilirubin. And what this glucuronic acid does is it makes conjugated bilirubin water soluble. So it can be dissolved in water easily. And the reason why we want conjugated bilirubin to be water soluble is so that it can be excreted in bile. So it can enter into the gallbladder and then be excreted in bile. This is how we can get rid of bilirubin. So we want it conjugated so it can be water soluble, so it can be excreted in the form of bile. So in Joubert syndrome, this mechanism is mildly deficient. So we lose part of this mechanism, which means that we don't get full conversion of unconjugated bilirubin to conjugated bilirubin to get rid of the bilirubin. So unconjugated bilirubin can build up, leading to signs of jaundice in the patient. So that's why in Gilbert syndrome, we see jaundice occurring. And eventually, the episode of jaundice can resolve because although this mechanism is mildly deficient, it can still slowly process the unconjugated bilirubin to conjugated bilirubin to eventually excrete it. So that is why the jaundice itself will eventually resolve. So what happens in Gilbert syndrome? What are the clinical features? So it's important to note that 30% of patients are actually asymptomatic, which means that they never have symptoms. But if there are symptoms, the onset of those symptoms generally occurs in puberty, and this is due to changes in hormones. And the main clinical finding is jaundice, that yellowing of the skin in the eyes. So we can see here, yellowing of the skin. And then if you look at the sclera, we can see yellowing of the sclera as well. So scleral icterus, this is what that is called. And we mentioned this before, the jaundice is intermittent and recurrent. And it actually has some interesting triggers. So triggers of these episodes of jaundice include sickness, fasting, dehydration, stress, and menstruation. So 
these are the triggers for having jaundice in Gilbert syndrome. And that is mostly the only finding we see with regards to Gilbert syndrome. There are possibly some other symptoms that have been noted. Some of these include nausea and vomiting, abdominal pain, and fatigue. Although these symptoms may not be related to the jaundice itself, it may not be related to the level of bilirubin present. So these may be associated symptoms, but may not be as well. So I just wanted to mention that here. So again, the clinical features of Gilbert syndrome can be anything from asymptomatic, which we see in about a third of patients, to oftentimes this recurrent intermittent episode of jaundice. And the triggers for these episodes include sickness, fasting, dehydration, stress, and menstruation, which lead to higher levels of bilirubin being produced, more than the capacity of the UDP glucuronal transferase enzyme can keep up with. That's why we get this higher level of unconjugated bilirubin. And then there may be other symptoms, although this is not necessarily the case, but other symptoms that may occur include nausea and vomiting, abdominal pain, and fatigue. So how is Gilbert syndrome diagnosed and treated? So clinicians diagnose Gilbert syndrome by the following. So in Gilbert syndrome, when there are these episodes of jaundice and bilirubin is checked in the blood, there are high levels of unconjugated bilirubin. So unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. And oftentimes this is shown several times and it's intermittent. So one episode, there's jaundice, it's checked, there's unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, it goes away. And then later there's another episode of jaundice, it's checked, and there's also unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. So several measurements like that often make clinicians suspicious for Gilbert syndrome, especially when other blood work is normal. So when liver enzymes are normal, like AST and ALT, these are normal. Other blood findings, so there's no evidence of hemolysis. Those types of findings often also add more credence to an individual having Gilbert syndrome. And it's also important to rule out other conditions as well. So Again, we talked about some of them, liver disease, hemolysis, those types of conditions, important to rule those out. So once a clinician has diagnosed Gilbert syndrome, how is it treated? There's actually no treatment required for Gilbert syndrome. This is a benign condition, as we mentioned before. So individuals with Gilbert syndrome will have episodes of jaundice, which will eventually go away, and they'll just have these recurrent episodes. So teaching the patient that some of these episodes may occur with some of those triggers we talked about before is important to also do as well. But again, this is a benign condition and no treatment is required. So again, diagnosis of Gilbert syndrome occurs with several intermittent measurements of unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia where other blood work is normal and other conditions have been ruled out. And there is no treatment required because this is a benign condition. So I hope you found this lesson helpful. If you did, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell. It helps support the channel and stay up to date on future lessons. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.